Okay, so next semester, I have to teach Shakespeare's The Tempest. The problem is, I hate The Tempest. Okay, I don't, I don't hate The Tempest. Yeah. I have, historically, I have hated The Tempest. But many people I know and, and love and respect, people who are very wise and knowledgeable, love The Tempest. I know people who love The Tempest. And so I'm trying to be more open to The Tempest. I'm trying to be a better man, which is actually what The Tempest is about. So here's one thing I noticed right away. It starts with a storm. And in this storm, the master says, Bosun, here master, what cheer? What cheer? Because it's an emergency. The ship is is in danger of sinking. It's not a very cheery moment, but that cheer, it, it's kind of, it's just an interesting turn of phrase, right? You know, maybe this is the, you know, a specific kind of phrase among sailors, but the context, this is about, you know, don't lose hope. Don't lose heart. So maybe this is a play about hope. That's something we could all use more of. Okay, so The Tempest is written probably around 1610, 1611. It's one of Shakespeare's final plays. It might be his last play. Except for this play, The Two Noble Kinsmen, which he co-wrote with a colleague, John Fletcher, around 1613. He writes these, these weird plays at the end of his career. And what are they? They're kind of, we used to call them the romances. Now we, we just call them the late plays. And what's he doing? I think one, one plausible interpretation is that he seems to be experimenting. He's had a long career, very successful. He's written all the tragedies and the comedies and the histories. And so at the end of his career, he starts experimenting. And these these late plays, they, they aren't exactly tragedies and they're not exactly comedies. They have certain darker elements that makes them more like tragedies, but they don't end tragically, which makes them more like comedies. The other thing about these late plays is that they there seem to be a lot of supernatural elements, although I don't know that that's really unique. Shakespeare, when you think about it, almost all of his plays actually have major supernatural elements, ghosts, a lot of ghosts, like magic potions that make you seem like you're dead when you're really just asleep. The late plays, I don't know, maybe they're more magical. There are like gods who descend riding eagles and Prospero is legitimately, he's a wizard. <laughs> he is a sorcerer. So he's pretty magical. But is that so different from a ghost? So the genre thing I think matters. You know, comedies tend to be about community, right? Harmony, bringing the community together, bringing these these various uh, sometimes discordant parts into harmony with each other. Tragedies, tragedies tend to be about overreaching, revenge, injustice. So they're about communities falling apart and people falling apart. So what's, what's this genre about? That's a question worth considering. How does this, the form, the shape of this play, what does that have to do with what the play means? I don't know. Okay, go birds. Hey, so the semester starts in five days and I've got to figure out the Tempest. My lighting is very dramatic. I don't have time to adjust it. I've got two kids downstairs who want me to build a blanket fort. So I want to think about the ship again, the ship and the storm. See, ships, Ships are meaningful, especially when there's kings aboard, because the metaphor that comes to mind is the ship of state. This is a very famous metaphor advanced often in, in political theory or political philosophical political conversations. And it's it's used to talk about, what, to explore what is the nature of political expertise. And that's the question aboard this ship. Who's in charge and why? Based on what? What? Like, what kind of authority is legitimate? This is this is something Shakespeare was especially invested in. He was interested throughout his career in the source and origin of power and authority and what made someone a legitimate or an illegitimate ruler. And in this way, Shakespeare really fits into a broader political philosophical movement going on in the 17th century. The origins of government where power came from, the foundations of legitimate political authority were under investigation. All sorts of political thinkers were, were interested in this, Machiavelli, Hobbes, and, and Shakespeare was no different. So on this boat in the middle of a storm, who is in charge? Is it the king? He's the highest ranking aristocrat, or is it the captain of the ship? Is it the person who actually knows how to sail the ship. And if, if the captain is the one with more authority, it's because he is the one with the correct kind of expertise 
for this situation. Is the suggestion here that the proper foundation of authority, legitimate authority, is based on knowledge? You have to have the right knowledge in order to be able to rule. That's very different than, than saying someone rules by birthright or by tradition or because they belong to a royal family. Because a, a king's authority is is supposed to be rooted in nature, right? Aristocrats, the, the, the well-born with their, with their good bloodlines, are supposed to be naturally superior to other people. Hey, Dad. Yes? We're adding three mini games to our fort. Okay. Oh, wait, are you recording a video? I am recording a video. Oh. <laughs> That's okay. Okay, we're back. The bosun even says, if you can command these elements to silence, use your authority. But of course, the, the king's power is not natural, at least not in this sense. This question about the relationship between nature and authority takes us to, I think, the, the crux of the real controversy around this play. Because we see right away in, in scene two, the person who does have authority over nature is Prospero. And it's his art that gives him power over nature. That's the source of his authority. But, you know, when, when he starts talking to Miranda, some questions emerge. What is the source of Prospero's power? He's got magical garments. He's got magical books. He's got uh, a really good liberal arts education. He's also got Ariel, right? This, this spirit who is also kind of enslaved to Prospero. So is Prospero powerful? Because one other thing is he's trapped right on this island so he's not that powerful this is when we also find out about caliban so caliban has become kind of a an academic scholarly and theatrical flashpoint the dynamic between prospero and caliban is often seen as as representative or illustrative of the dynamic between colonizers and the colonized generations of scholars and directors actors have found in Caliban's story and the way Prospero treats him certain echoes of the ways that, that imperial powers, colonial powers have treated indigenous peoples all over the world. The battery died on my camera. Hold on. Are you okay? I'm a little tilted. Okay, Kim F. Hall. Kim F. Hall has said, Caliban has been read alternatively as Black African, Afro-Caribbean, and Native American. However, in all these permutations, he embodies and resists ideologies of dark and light, even as he is continually read as dark other. So Caliban is very hard to categorize, very hard to define. The way Prospero treats him as subhuman and governs him with force, calls him wicked and a devil, all of this reminds us of the ways that colonial powers treated indigenous or native populations and represented their their imperial enterprises as civilizing missions here's where this gets dark because prospero seems to believe that that caliban's nature makes it necessary to govern him forcefully and this of course is the same logic that underpins slavery and colonial genocides throughout history and we want to recoil at that idea initially but there is this problem early in the text as we are told that you know, Caliban was, was fairly well treated. He was in a good relationship with Prospero until he tried to assault his daughter. And when this accusation is made, Caliban does not deny it. He joyfully says, oh, I would have populated this whole island with Calibans if I had been successful. Super creepy. It's not clear to me anyway that Shakespeare necessarily agrees with Prospero. He might, he might think that Caliban is, is kind of naturally slavish and that's kind of disturbing, but I don't know that that's the case necessarily. Maybe I hate Prospero. Maybe that's the problem. But maybe I'm supposed to hate Prospero. Maybe we're supposed to hate Prospero. This may be my other difficulty with this play. Who do I sympathize with here? I don't like Prospero. I don't like Caliban, really. I guess there's a love story. Some of the nobles are plucked from the ship and like dispersed across the island by Ariel. And one of them is Ferdinand, the Prince of Naples. And so there's this nice little like love at first sight moment between Miranda and Ferdinand. Miranda's never seen a boy before, so. But the creepy thing here is that Prospero is like puppet mastering the whole thing. Like he's, you know, playing matchmaker. Mostly dads in Shakespeare are misguided, if not bad. You know, King Lear or 
uh, Brabantio, if you've read Othello, or Midsummer Night's Dream begins with a bad dad, Shylock in Merchant of Venice. Dads are often, you know, kind of policing who their daughters marry and date in Shakespeare. And usually, Shakespeare suggests that's a problem. It's a bad idea, this kind of petty patriarchal tyranny. And so here, we have a dad who has the power to, like, you know, make his daughter fall in love with this boy that he's, like, brought from a ship. That's not a power dad should have. Maybe there's something here, like, maybe I don't like it because it's, like, too much of myself. Like, I'm a dad. I would probably like this power to, like, you know, get my children to like the things that I want them to like and avoid the things that I want them to avoid. But that would be bad. So the question we should think about is this, right? Earlier, I was thinking about hope. Hope. How does the hope that the bosun is talking about correspond to this question about nature and authority or about power? Because it seems that all of Prospero's hopes early in the play, his hopes to like leave the island, to get his daughter married off, to get like revenge or justice, whatever he's after, they seem to be uh, tied to his magical power, right? His power over nature gives him hope. But the hope the hope of the bosun, the hope in the storm is almost like a surrender. So one question, is Prospero, does he have as much control as he thinks he has? Crucially, the power he seems to possess does not actually belong to him. And he's only able to, to undertake this, this whole enterprise because this ship has happened along, right? Because Providence brought it here. Prospero didn't bring it here. So is he in control or not? He's powerful, but he's a prisoner. Does his power make him a prisoner? My name is Dr. Moore. I teach great books at St. Thomas University. Maybe I teach you great books at St. Thomas University. If you enjoyed this, you might want to watch one of those over here. Talk to you soon.